Well, we've just reached the top of the hour, so let's get started. Welcome to the 2021 Ground Truth Seminar Series. This is the eighth of nine Ground Truth Seminars running from October through December 14th. We are recording the session and we'll be posting it to our webpage in case any viewers can see it again or if people miss this opportunity. Since we're doing this seminar remotely, the speaker will use an electronic pointer or be descriptive when indicating specific things on the slides. To help with this format, we ask that you mute your audio and turn off your video feed to reduce distractions for all the other participants. Also, please keep your questions for the end of the seminar, at which point you can unmute yourself and ask questions directly to the speaker, or you can type your questions into the chat box at any time during the seminar, and I will compile them to ask following the presentation. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to remind everyone to join us for next week's speaker, Rebecca Peters from the Maine Department of Marine Resources. Rebecca will present the last installment of the 2021 Ground Truth Seminar Series entitled The Maine New Hampshire Inshore Trawl Survey, We Catch More Than Lobster, which will be held at the same time next Tuesday, December 14th. Today's speaker, Jane DeCosimo, is a fisheries consultant with more than 30 years of experience at federal, regional, state, and international fisheries agencies in the North Pacific and East Coast. She has worked for the Virginia Marine Resources Commission, the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council, the North Pacific Fishery Management Council, and the NIMS Office of Science and Technology. Jane is an expert in bridging science and policy to develop strategic management approaches for commercial, recreational, and subsistence fisheries. She has a master's degree in fishery science from the Virginia Institute of Marine Science and a bachelor's degree in zoology from Rutgers University. Take it away, Jane. Thank you, Mark. Uh, today, I will be talking to you about the who, what, where, when, why, how, but not necessarily in that order of uh, the federal management process for the North Pacific and specifically the power of participation and collaboration and how that leads to success in the Alaska groundfish fisheries. Uh, I've organized the presentation to give you a background in the Alaska groundfish fisheries, uh, a quick snapshot of NOAA fisheries at the three levels of, uh, say, offices, headquarters, uh, the regional office, and the Fishery Science Center. I'll talk a little bit about the North Pacific Fishery Management Council and how it's been structured and created. Um, and I'll talk about cooperative research among and between NIMS universities and the fishing industry, the role of public participation in the success of fisheries management, and then I'll summarize at the end. So uh, for those familiar or not familiar, here's a picture of the Alaska fishery management areas. Uh, the North Pacific Partnership oversees more than 50% of the fish caught in US waters, contributing over $7 billion. Uh, you'll see the uh, different uh, areas. The Arctic Ocean is comprised of the Beaufort Sea and the Chukchi Sea. We have the Bering Sea and the Aleutian Islands, which are managed jointly. And then we have the Gulf of Alaska, which is managed under its own FMP also. Uh, the EEZ, the Exclusive Economic Zone, is between three and 200 nautical miles offshore. Uh, it's equivalent to about one and a half million square miles and covers more than 70% or so of the US continental shelf. And just for comparison, I've got the inset of the Alaska North Pacific area relative to the rest of the United States and the, uh, the rest of the coastline. Uh, the state of Alaska manages intro waters, that is from zero to three miles. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about how some of that co-management works for different fisheries. There's two ground fish fishery management plans, one for the Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands combined. There's 26 species complexes within that um, uh, management area with a 2 million metric ton quota limit. And I'll talk more about that limit, how it would, how it came about and what its importance is. Gulf of Alaska, uh, in, you know, including Kodiak, 
uh, Prince William Sound uh, through the Alaska uh, Panhandle has about the same number of species and complexes, but you'll see uh, order of magnitude uh, lower biomass uh, and a, a quota only 25% in general of the 2 million metric ton cap in the Bering Sea and Lucian Islands. Quick snapshot of the commercial ground fish fishing vessels in Alaska. Uh, the catcher vessels or CVs deliver shoreside. Uh, catcher processors or CPs may, may process at sea, but may also deliver shoreside. Uh, and then there's a breakdown of the different types of vessels, trawlers and the species, the target species and fisheries uh, that uh, that vessel is, is used for. Uh, long liners, jig gears, dredges, and pot gear. Um, one uh, tidbit, so to speak, of the uh, size of these vessels is that even a small long liner, 35, 40, 50 feet, might be considered a large boat in the rest of the United States. And so, you know, even within Alaska, the uh, at, sea, uh, sea, at sea processors may be 200 or more feet long, um, and that is what we consider a big boat compared to perhaps some of the, um, our, our smaller boats might be other regions, larger boats. Bering Sea Aleutian Island ground fish quota categories are listed here. I'm gonna focus on the Bering Sea Aleutian Islands just for simplicity uh, and um, speed. You know, I, I, I'm covering a lot of information and I'll just focus on the BSAI. For now, 22 total quota categories. Uh, you may remember I said 26 are within that area. Only 22 are, are quota categories. They, they get um, a commercial quota. Uh, you'll see that the species are, uh, their, their names are color coded to associate with these tiers. Um, the tiers reflect the amount and quality of data that go into each of the stock assessments. So tier one stock assessments are conducted for Eastern Bering Sea Pollock, Yellowfin Sole, Northern Rock Sole. Um, and this again relies, uh, reflects the level and quality of data. Um, the higher in the tier level, meaning tier one is at the highest, means the most information that you have um, which means that you have greater scientific certainty, which leads you to greater management certainty. And so you can have a attack either equal to or close to your acceptable biological catch limit. Um, so basically the buffers can be smaller when you have less uncertainty compared with say sharks and octopus where our uh, tier six categories, which is basically catch only information um, we don't have uh, uh, sufficient data to estimate a biomass that is um, uh, um, at the level at which we can reduce that buffer. So there may be larger buffers between attack and an ABC, um, but typically on these tier six species, the quota is set only equal to the amount of, of harvest that is expected to come either in a directed fishery or as bycatch, and in these instances, these are these are principally bycatch species. And then tier three, tier five, it's again the gradients of different quality of information available. I'll talk more about that. Um, so my supposition in the talk is that groundfish fisheries in the North Pacific are well managed, and this is one graphical display of that. So we have the two million metric ton optimum yield cap, which uh, had always been policy for the council starting in the mid 70s, but after an amendment to the Magnus and Stevens Act has been now set in statute. So it is a limit that cannot be exceeded in terms of setting the total allowable catch or, or annual catch limit or quota, different terms for the same thing. Below that line, you'll see the catch of Pollock uh, in yellow is specific cod in pink is flatfish and in black is all other fish. And you'll see again, <clears throat> excuse me, that the um, fisheries are, are managed so that the catch does not exceed the tack. 
Um, and that OY limit cannot be raised even when you have fluctuating high and low um, acceptable biological catch and overfishing limit shown here in the, in the pink dashed lines, regardless of the fluctuation of biomass, that OY is a upper limit that will not be exceeded. And then the council has these accountability measures to make sure that the catch does not exceed the tax. And I'll talk more about those. Another way to uh, look at the at successful management of this uh, ground fish group is this uh, Kobe plot, which shows that the, in the green part here, you have all of the fish, all of the ground fish stocks and complexes identified as not being overfished and overfishing not occurring. So you never want to be in this um, upper left corner box of that you, any stock is overfished or experiencing overfishing and you don't want to be in these yellow alert zones either. And if I might, the closer you are to this right hand bottom corner, the, the better the, the status of the stock is. So one of the tools that the Magnuson Act has provided to the councils, and these are mandatory, is that all of these 10 national standards must be adhered to in making any of its decisions. Principal among them is national standard one to prevent overfishing while achieving optimum yield. And you'll notice I've bolded prevent overfishing so that this is a balancing act of preventing overfishing while achieving optimum yield. And a why in this context is trying to get as much catch out of the water as uh, conservation will allow. So that when the council is balancing these two objectives, there's a little, you know, the scales are tipped more in favor of preventing overfishing when the council has uh, to do that balancing act. And national standard two is to use best scientific information available. Um, and it has its scientific advisors that I'll talk about in a little bit, um, it, uh, helping the council make, uh, make decisions based on that um, best scientific information. Sometimes it may be debatable what what data should or shouldn't be used, uh, and that's where um, these uh, external bodies uh, are helpful to the council. And all of these ten are considered when the council is making uh, its decisions. So, who are the decision makers in uh, the North Pacific? Principally, it's the North Pacific Fishery Management Council and the National Marine Fisheries Service. Together, they manage the U.S. fisheries off Alaska, again in the EEZ, the three to 200 nautical mile zone. And management is sometimes coordinated or jointly managed with the state of Alaska, which I've mentioned has zero to three miles. Uh, there are um, some, some species or species complexes that are, occur more in state waters, and so the state has the lead in the development of stock assessments um, and in fact, the state of Alaska has a parallel Pacific cod fishery in the Gulf of Alaska, where it allocates 25% of the federal quota to its state water fisheries. And then the council and NIMS deduct that up to 25% guideline harvest level off of the federal tax to make sure, again, that none of those harvest limits I've mentioned are exceeded. Council makes recommendations to NIMS. NIMS approves, implements, and enforces them. I'm going to transition now to uh, uh, National Marine Fisheries Service, and I'll start with headquarters. So the National Marine Fisheries Service, shown over here with this green arrow, is one of six line offices that are part of NOAA. Uh, and NOAA is part of the, the, excuse me, the Department of Commerce. So um, these are the uh, leader, the leadership for the National Marine Fisheries Service, the assistant administrator, the deputy for operations, the deputy for regulatory programs, and our science director. And uh, it's mostly at that level that there are um, uh, collaborations and exchange of information across the line offices so that maybe folks like me, you know, a worker B isn't having a whole lot of con direct contact with folks in these other offices, but the leadership is. So I wanna focus a little more on um, the National Marine Fishery Service at headquarters. And that uh, little box is now reflected 
in this upper left uh, hand corner uh, of this slide, such that Janet Coit is the new and current assistant administrator for fisheries. Um, some of you may be familiar with her predecessor, Chris Oliver, who uh, served in that role in the previous administration and was the former executive director of the North Pacific Council itself. Uh, Sam Rauch is the deputy assistant administrator for regulatory programs, and you'll see these are color coded. So he oversees the regulatory programs, which includes the Office of Sustainable Fisheries, which I'll talk more about, Office of Protected Resources, Office of Habitat Conservation, and then the five regional offices. And uh, I'll talk more also about the Alaska Regional Office in a moment. Science advisor is uh, Dr. Cisco Werner, along with his advisors on ecosystem economics and stock assessments. And again, color coded over to the purple box for uh, they oversee the science programs. That includes the Office of Science and Technology, where I was uh, situated during my tenure with NIMS at headquarters, the Alaska Fisheries Science Center director, uh, off, uh, center, uh, as well as the other five science centers are shown here. And I'll talk more about both s and and the Alaska Center. Uh, these additional operational offices are under the purview of uh, Dr. Doremus. Uh, these are national offices that support similar activities throughout the regions and the centers, and I'm, I won't be talking more about them uh, anymore. Uh, but I just want to note, you know, over 4,000 people work uh, for NIMS. As the staff, there are numerous additional contractors uh, that, um, you know, span the number of staff that support these offices. So I'm going to talk a little more about uh, regula the regulatory programs and the Office of Science and Technology. The two specific ones are uh, OSF, Sustainable Fisheries, and more particularly the Domestic Fisheries Division. There's also uh, HMS, Highly Migratory Species Operations, and then within each of these there are branches. And so um, council support comes um, primarily from policy and guidance branch and the sustainable stocks and ecosystems branch. Uh, examples of the national coordination that happens at headquarters is strategic planning, budgeting, and execution. By execution, I mean kind of shooting the money out the door to the regional offices. Um, they're in, in charge of uh, developing and implementing fisheries policies and regulations, tracking the status of stocks, um, administering the council budgets, and by that, you know, again, shooting the money out the door. They're responsible for training new council members and for supporting uh, the council coordination committee. That's a committee that meets twice a year. It's comprised of NIMS leadership at headquarters, as well as the center and regional directors from each of the regions, as well as the executive director and chair of each of the eight councils. Um, and those meet twice a year, once sponsored by one of the eight councils in their territory, home territory. And the second meeting occurs typically in the DC Silver Spring, Maryland area. Office in Science and Technology, not designed, um, you, know, you won't see comparable uh, distribution of activities um, with the centers, uh, but there's a statistics division, uh, an OMI, uh, kind of budgeting, administration, contracts, office, economics and social analysis. Um, this is kind of where all the data and um, IT stuff lives, marine ecosystems division. And this is where I was uh, in the assessment and monitoring division. And a lot of the activities that I'll be talking about in this talk that support stock assessments, that support data collection are driven out of this division, uh, the two branches here, uh, Fish and Protected Species Assessments and the Fisheries and Living Marine Resource Monitoring. So s and is responsible for national coordination of the, the uh, programs that I've identified here in the, in the bullet list. So they do the strategic planning, budgeting, and execution for the fishery centers. They coordinate the Center for Independent Expert External Peer Reviews. Uh, that are routinely conducted for stock assessments and for other science programs. Uh, they're responsible for national coordination of 
stock assessment improvement, including the development of new models and new tools uh, responsible for national databases, uh, for coordinating fishery surveys. And there's often, uh, I'll talk about this uh, later, um, some look, Alaska slides on fishery surveys, um, but it can often be, it is a competition um, among the six line offices for the NOAA white ships in terms of uh, you know, allocating limited number of days at sea. Uh, there's national coordination of observer programs. And when I started with NIMS headquarters at SNT, I was the national observer program coordinator. Um, afterwards, I became a, a branch chief in, uh, these have been reorganized since I left, um, but I had the assessment at most of these activities under, under my domain, everything except protected resources. Um, and advanced technologies was another among those. It includes, uh, and I'll have a slide on this, uh, you know, sail drones to electronic monitoring and reporting. Um, cooperative research is also managed in this uh, division. Uh, that's the national coordination for um, uh, getting money to the different centers and regions where necessary to do their uh, cooperative research with industry, but also competitive process uh, for industry led research and then ecosystem management um, that feeds back into these stock assessments in terms of data collection, but also modeling. So again, snapshot, just a, a national picture of the surveys um, that through an entire fiscal year, there's more than 50 surveys, um, both on the NOAA white ships as well as chartered commercial vessels, uh, more than 2000 days at sea, uh, and uh, an annual process of uh, developing a fleet allocation plan across the six uh, line offices uh, it occurs on an annual basis. Last year, due to the pandemic, um, not very many of the surveys were able to be conducted um, for, for obvious reasons, I think. So turning to the stock assessments, uh, NOAA, manages nearly 500 fish stocks and complexes and conducts nearly 200 stock assessments each year. Um, the stock assessment Im uh, improvement is evident in the blue line on this right side of the, of the uh, slide uh, and the dollars. Uh, the agency has been extremely successful at getting um, annual allocations of con congressional dollars dedicated to increasing capacity for stock assessments. That's um, staffing up uh, as well as um, the data collection that's needed to improve the assessments. And so while you may see a leveling off of the number of assessments, I'll talk about that um, when I transition to this part of the slide, but um, the flattening out of the stock assessments is not necessarily um, a bad thing. It, it means that we're uh, using our resources more effectively at improving the assessments that we do have and um, changing perhaps the timing of how frequent um, um, less data driven assessments are being conducted. And that takes me to the NOAA Fisheries Next Generation Stock Assessment Enterprise. This is a, a, a an amazing document that the s and produced in 2018 um, that had a lot of contribution from around the country uh, to look at how we're doing stock assessments and how uh, numerous recommendations on how to improve them uh, to make them more holistic and ecosystem linked, make them more innovative, innovative and to make them more timely, efficient and effective. And I'll talk more about that. So here is one outcome from that next generation stock assessment, and that is to categorize existing assessments as either research, operational, or just stock monitoring. Research stock assessments are those that have new methods or new data sources, not, not an additional year of the existing data sources, but a new data source. These undergo rigorous and independent peer reviews that could be by the Council's Scientific and Statistical Committee, its Stock Assessment Review Panel, but also likely may be uh, the CIE, the Center for Independent Expert um, Review. Uh, so that's the most comprehensive in terms of the, the um, quality, for lack of a better word, of the stock assessments. Operational stock assessments 
um, are those that have undergone this process, the uh, you know external review process, have been accepted and now are incorporating um, updated data. It has a much more streamlined peer review. And then we have the stock monitoring update, which um, maybe these operational assessments that only are being updated, turn the crank, so to speak, with just one more year's worth of catch data, maybe no additional age uh, aging data are, are available to be incorporated into the model um, and minimal review is required when all you're doing is just updating the catch information. All three of these types of assessments are uh, go through the rigorous uh, review, um, but only the research and operational assessments are used for stock status determination, overfishing or um, overfished. And all of them go through the review process for determination of harvest level recommendations. So the assessments, the author's recommendations, and the stock assessment review panel in the North Pacific, they're called the plan team. Um, all of their recommendations go to the scientific and statistical committee to uh, determine the OFL and ABC. Uh, the advisory panel, this box should probably be down here because it uses the OFL and ABC to develop its recommendations for the total allowable catch or tax, which in addition to what the SSC recommends all goes to the council and the council recommends the ACLs, which is basically the tax. Sorry for so many um, um, acronyms. Um, but ultimately, all of this information goes to the secretary for approval and um, implementation by NOAA Fisheries. And you'll see a similar one for how uh, this actually comes out in, a, uh, in practice momentarily. Advanced technologies is one of those categories that I mentioned uh, that s and does the national coordination. Everything from sail drones to electronic monitoring and electronic reporting through the observer program and self-reported data from um, captains. Uh, whole, whole talk on this uh, I can do. So that next generation stock assessment, again, we're trying to simplify um, and, and qualify to provide in qualitative way um, all of the information that is being collected or, or we hope to be collecting for ecosystem ecosystem based fisheries management ebfm another acronym um it's it's mind boggling you know what the expectations and what direction in which the agency is going for actually quantitatively incorporating um all of these types of uh, data into stock assessments and there's a lot of work going on in ecosystem modeling uh, to accomplish that, but this is just a, a way to simplify to to better communicate um, that type of information to a general audience to the councils um, on terms of what the drivers are for ecosystem and socioeconomics and what their potential effects are for both fish and fisheries and you'll see the ecosystem effects affecting both those two categories, fish and fisheries, where the socioeconomic and um, on human behavior and human organization is affecting the fisheries. We're not really controlling what happens in the ocean, but we can ha we can control what happens um, on the boats, so to speak. Um, so going one more level in terms of what the drivers are, this is a qualitative depiction of the relative amount of human drivers and pressures on each of the Alaska ecosystems, Gulf of Alaska, Aleutian Islands, Eastern Bering Sea, and the Arctic. I mean, um, I'll, the, um, I'll show a little bit, there's no fishing in the Arctic, and so that's why this box, this box is empty. But so here you have the uh, ecosystems, and here you have just example uh, drivers from fishing to forestry, and what their relative impact is in each ecosystem. The uh, Office of Science and Technology, after an internal review in 2010, identified um, a need for integrating ecosystem approaches into the management 
uh, arena, so to speak, uh, and was successful in getting congressional funding specific to these goals. And so five councils are working with NIMS staff to develop um, integrated ecosystem uh, plans. Uh, Alaska, thankfully, is one of them. So these factors, you know, are, are part of this cycle of defining ecosystem-based management goals and targets, developing these types of indicators, assessing the ecosystem relative to these indicators, analyzing the uncertainty and the risk of the information we do have and the information we don't have to evaluate whether our strategies are successful or not, and uh, leading to implementing management actions, monitoring those ecosystem indicators that we've identified as useful, and evaluating and assessing the outcomes in this do loop system. This is summarizing in one, you know, graphic, uh, a tremendous amount of effort uh, ongoing by the agency. Switching now to the regional office. Um, there are numerous divisions, sustainable fisheries, protected resources, habitat, excuse me, habitat conservation, uh, uh, similar operations and management, IT, and another division for restricted access management. The North Pacific Council has so many limited access uh, programs that uh, it warrants um, that additional level of, of staffing. Within sustainable fisheries, which uh, is the principal interactor in terms of the staff and the councils and headquarters for that matter. And the center um, includes an ecosystem branch, in season management, monitoring branch, catch your branch, catch accounting and data quality, and the operations branch. Um, and I'll touch on you know, how these all interact um, momentarily, but they're all critical to the success of groundfish management in Alaska in terms of you know, not exceeding those harvest level recommendations, the TAC, ABC, OFL, et cetera, and to keep us all from, keep all of the groundfish from getting um, out of the good box, the green box, and into any of the alert boxes in terms of overfishing and overfish status. So examples of regional coordination between um, headquarters and the council is the development of a regional operating agreement. Each of the councils have one. Um, the one for the North from for the North Pacific is is specifically between the regional office and the council, and it defines um, what the responsibilities are for both the council and the region, as well as what contributions the staff uh, provides. Um, so the regional office staff uh, provides strategic planning. It writes and implements the fishery regulations and contributes to. Council analyses for every action that will either uh, that will amend either the regulations or the fishery management plan. There's some areas uh, that the uh, regional office staff or office of law, law enforcement or NOAA general counsel. We need those experts to provide what the implications are for that those impacts on a fishery for any proposed action. Uh, and so we rely on that regional office expertise for that. Uh, catch accounting, again, um, including the new category of electronic monitoring data. I'll talk about that in the next slide in more detail. And again, the restricted access management for the for the laps or limited access programs. So here's um, a summary slide for the catch accounting process, all the data going in, observer data. Um, these are uh, trained uh, scientific staff that are on the commercial fishing vessels that are sampling the catch and um, estimating their, their size, species composition, taking uh, otoliths for aging, you know, for a variety of special projects, uh, but are quote unquote eyes and ears on the water. Electronic monitoring, uh, these are cameras on board those same vessels to either augment or replace observers on vessels. Uh, the self reports from industry, uh, vessel tracking information, uh, the permit data all going into a catch accounting system to accomplish two things to estimate total catch of the retained catch and the bycatch. And then the output are catch accounting reports that are used by in season management. Um, by the time the quotas by species or species complex are divided by season, by gear, by area and sub area. 
for different fisheries uh, and then uh, separate bycatch limits. There's hundreds of openings and closings that in season management uses catch accounting data uh, to perform. And that it's those accountability measures that are, are keeping all of those harvest limits from being exceeded. Um, the fishery participants themselves access uh, the catch accounts and that all of that information uh, that is non-confidential is available through a public web portal. The uh, data also is available routinely uh, through formal and informal council requests, informal data requests by the council, by other NIMS offices, and by the public. Uh, the data is incorporated in the Alaska Fisheries Information Network. There's a FIN, a Fisheries Information Network around the country for the different regions. Alaska has its own. Um, it includes the state of Alaska catch data also, uh, and also is used by the Alaska Fisheries Science Center for a number of research needs, as well as the stock assessments, a principal user. Positioning to the center, um, the supports the staff from the center, support council activities and regional activities um, more widely than uh, at the other levels. Um, we have uh, Off Bay Laboratory um, has a marine ecology and assessment group. So some of the stock assessments are coming from the Auk Bay staff. Um, the Fisheries Monitoring and Analysis Division is basically the Alaska Observer Program, um, integral in collecting the data um, that, are, that are used for management. The Resource Assessment and Conservation Engineering Division, um, you can see, I won't read them all off to you, but there's a lot of, a lot of research and data collection going there. And then resource ecology and fisheries management has the aging growth group, the economists and the social scientists. It has the ecosystem uh, uh, branch and the modeling team. And then uh, the status of stocks and multi-species assessment branch is uh, where all of the numerous stock assessment uh, authors um, work both on the assessment and on other research projects to enhance stock assessments. Just a quick snapshot of um, where the Alaska offices are for those less familiar with, the, um, with the, either the center or Alaska in general. The main campus for the Alaska Fisheries Science Center is in Seattle. The um, center director is located at the Off Bay Laboratory in Juneau. Uh, there's also a Kodiak Fisheries uh, Lab. Um, the Observer Program has offices both in Dutch Harbor and the Aleutian Chain, as well as in Anchorage. And then there's additional field stations where um, other research is ongoing, including uh, Newport, Oregon. So I've mentioned research surveys uh, a couple of times, and here is the um, non-comprehensive list of all of the different research surveys that are happening in this fiscal year. Um, both on the NOAA white ships as well as some chartered commercial vessels, not going into any great detail, but just trying to carry you through, you know, from the line offices to headquarters and now to the to the regional um, effect of where all that money flows and the research and data that's collected that feeds into stock assessments. So speaking of that. Um, many of the survey, excuse me, stock assessments are linked to the frequency of the surveys. So you'll see um, annual stock assessments related to annual surveys by sometimes biennial uh, stock assessments to the every other year survey, for instance, Bogoslav and Aleutian Islands Pollock. Um, and then you'll also see these number fours. Uh, so this also goes back to that tier system of, um, maybe I used the wrong word there, but the, the ne next generation stock assessments that showed the research assessments, the operational assessments, and then just the monitoring. So, um, the, the less, so other flatfish, for instance, are um, typically identified at that by observers, by the industry, they just say other flatfish. So we're not able to break them out by the specific species categories um, for which we have better information. And so um, these other flatfish categories are pretty much a catch-all and 
um, the system has identified that these can be done every four years rather than every one year or every two years. And, and we don't lose any, anything by doing, by doing that. So you'll see the frequency tier ones are, are, um, often done annually because we have the most, it's kind of linked, right? So you get the most data, you have the highest tier, therefore, because you have the data, you're doing stock assessments more frequently. So just to summarize the ATSI data collection by government research ships, by the charter vessels, and by observers and cameras on commercial fishing, fishing boats leads to um, uh, the, the, the best science management and policy that we can do. Now, moving to regional councils. Summary slide, the council is guided by the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act of 1976. It established eight regional councils around the country. They manage the three to 200 mile EEZ. They rely on or are required to rely on the national standards and other conservation and management requirements specified in the MSA. Um, and under this science-based framework, 47 stocks have been rebuilt since 2000. 90% of stocks are not subject to overfishing and 80% are not overfished. There still remain 46 stocks deemed overfished and 22 deemed subject to overfishing. Um, any of the remainders, we just don't know. They're, they're categorized as unknown. We just don't have the um, staff or money resources to collect everything we would ever want to know about everything. And so there will remain some unknowns. So what do the councils do? They are required by the Magnuson Act to do four things. Develop and amend fishery management plans, set annual catch limits and accountability measures, develop research priorities with scientists and their stakeholder industry partners, and adhere to the MSA's mandate and 10 national standards. Councils have two types of voting members. There are appointed members that generally come from a slate of, of uh, potential candidates that a governor identifies to the Secretary of Commerce, he, off, he or she may identify a preferred uh, among the three names, and the Secretary, however, can pick from among those three individuals. If it, the Secretary doesn't like uh, or think that those three individuals are, are qualified, they can return the slate of candidates to the governor and say, you know, give me another slate. Uh, very rare for that to happen, also less Often the secretary doesn't pick the governor's preferred name, but it but it does and can happen. Um, the these appointed members are nominated um, and serve three year terms and can serve three consecutive three year terms. So after nine years, you're off. You can be off for a year and you can come back again. But you three uh, cons uh, consecutive three year terms in a row. Then there are the designated state and federal members. Those include. For instance, the Alaska Regional uh, Administrator, the uh, Alaska Department of Fish and Game Representative, uh, non-voting members are the Coast Guard, State Department, Fish and Wildlife Service, and Interstate Commissions. Uh, those individuals may come to every meeting, every agenda item. They may pick those that they have some um, importance with or you know, relevance with. Um, they may stay for you know just specific agenda items, and they may stay for the whole meeting. Uh, how do they operate? They must have a public and transparent process, and I'll talk more about that. Stakeholders have opportunities for involvement during every stage of decision making. Uh, the councils have an advisory body. Um, this particular council has one stakeholder advisory panel that advises directly the council. Other councils use their advisory panels to advise the staff and the development of plan and regulatory amendments. Um, and um, the councils all have a scientific and statistical committee. They may meet with different frequencies. They may um, meet in timing with their stock assessment cycle for a particular FMP. In the North Pacific, um, it meets at every meeting and considers every action the council takes that has um, biological, economic, or social implications. Uh, and the council also has the, what used to be a plan development team. It's really now the stock assessment review panel. Um, and it has numerous industry committees. 
Council decisions are based on best scientific information that's peer reviewed in public meetings, which allow fishermen to participate and fishermen also participate. To, excuse me, participate in cooperative research projects with NIM scientists and state scientists. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. The council has a range of management actions that it may take. It must set quotas, but within that, it can um, identify, it can subdivide those quotas by gear types and seasons. Uh, it likely has uh, bycatch limits and prohibited species catch limits. These are the, these PSC species are those that are not com have a commercial direct fishery, halibut, salmon, herring. They're either managed internationally or by the state. Uh, the councils may have closed areas for protected resources. Um, they are required to describe and identify essential fish habitat. They are required to uh, consider community protections. It's one of the national standards. And it may um, create limited access programs, sector allocations, rationalization privileges, all different names for, for LAPS. Area closures, just a quick snapshot of the number and uh, geographical range and the types of closures. The Arctic is permanently closed for direct commercial fishing. There's a range of uh, marine mammal or uh, halibut nursery areas. Um, uh, haul out areas for walrus, you know, just a, a wide range. You, you see them on the slide. Getting back to the quota setting process that I've um, referenced a, a time or two with the next generation stock assessment. So this is what it looks like for the North Pacific. Independent review, um, internal NIMS review in the development of the chapters that go into this stock assessment and fishery evaluation report, which is an annual compilation of all of the uh, 26 assessments. <clears throat> um, scientific review by both the plan team uh, and the SSC, all available for the public to interact with um, all the way through the council. Then the uh, NIM staff developed the federal register notification for those quotas, ABCs and OFLs, another opportunity for the public to comment, and then final review and approval by the Secretary of Commerce. And this is where I mentioned earlier, the better your data is, higher up the tier system, the, the smaller your buffer can be uh, between your, your TIC and your ABC, and the smaller buffer can be between your ABC and your OFL. The less, the more scientific uncertainty you have, um, the wider those buffers um, will tend to be. The council has five annual meetings, three are in Anchorage. One is in an Alaska fishing community, it could be Sitka, Juneau, Homer, Nome, Dutch Harbor. Um, and one meeting each year is in either the Seattle area or the Portland area. All meetings are open to the public. Um, that uh, in the North Pacific Council's case, the SSC and the advisory panel meet simultaneous in the same building, um, same floor typically, um, uh, and has public input at each meeting, um, shown in the, uh, you know this slide here, this part here. The agenda and the schedule and all of the documents are accessible through the council's website, and um, the council meeting uh, prior to the pandemic was had audio listen only mode, uh, but since the uh, pandemic, um, all three of the meetings have been virtual with opportunities for public testimony. I've mentioned the advisory panel, the SSC, the, the plan teams and the committees that the council has. There's some standing committees that advise the council on a routine basis, but there are also issue specific committees that provide advice on particular actions that come as a result of this plan and regulatory amendment cycle. So um, an action is initiated through a proposal, either through an individual person who writes a letter to the council or uh, through a council member making a motion his or herself to uh, change the status quo in terms of either the plan, the fishery management plan or the federal fishery regulations. Um, it goes through uh, a, a series of steps in developing the problem statement and a range of alternatives, may go to a discussion paper or 
uh, may get kicked to a committee to develop a problem statement and alternatives. It may go straight to initial review for changing um, for decision making if it's something that's uh, simple, straightforward, and is a priority. Um, other, um, in any case, regardless of the speed, it will go through uh, this uh, sequence of initial review and final action so that uh, the public has an opportunity at the initial review stage, including the AP and the SSC, the plan team, and uh, any relevant committees have an opportunity to review the analysis and provide feedback on the problem statement, the range of alternatives, and the actual results of the analysis. Um, there may be multiple itera iterations of that document before it's ready for final action where the council identifies a preferred alternative. Uh, it then goes into the system for development of the accompanying federal regulations and plan amendment language. Um, but ultimately, it's submitted to the secretary where um, the proposed rule with an additional opportunity for public comment happens. And then finally, the, the final rule is uh, imp, uh, decision is made by the Secretary of Commerce and it's implemented. This cycle could take six months at the least for an emergency or a very high priority or very simple action. It could take 10 years. I've um, uh, worked on several that have taken 10 years and that's because the proposal is attempting to solve a very complicated problem that affects a lot of different types of fishermen or communities um, or sectors and it just takes a long time to get to um, a resolution on what those uh, what the final uh, change might be uh, moving to uh, collaborations uh, between NIMS and industry, one example is the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. <clears throat> Just this year, it's awarded uh, nearly $4 million in 12 grants to support electronic technology and modernization of data management. Uh, the grants generate seven, almost $8 million in the non-federal matching contributions for a total of more than 11 million just in 2021, or I guess it's awarded this year for implementation next year with the goal of implementation, excuse me, <clears throat> not general research projects, but we're trying to get um, improvements to EM and ER to improve our data management systems. Since 2015, the program has awarded more than $25 million for 83 projects with an additional 60 million in matching. Uh, and Congress has identified this as, uh, as a priority and gives the agency um, three and a half million to pass through to NIFWF each year. And there's an additional comparable amount that the agency uses internally to staff up and to do the agency side of um, being able to, to use the data that would be coming in uh, on the um, off on the onshore platforms. EM in Alaska, there are seven EM programs designed to do two things, either monitor compliance with regulations or estimate the catch and discard. And the monitor EM programs are shown in the top half of the slide and the catch estimation is on the bottom. Um, the idea here is across, you know, sequentially through time between 2017 and now, we're trying to get as many vessels in this program in these programs as possible. You see incremental changes each quarter shown here. Um, uh, we've got the regulated programs. Uh, with the number of vessels kind of capped, right? Because it makes sense. We, those are already in regulation and everybody that wants to participate is in that program. We have another, uh, another uh, fishery that's uh, going through the exempted fishing permit phase, which allows the cameras to be on board the vessel in lieu of observers or in addition to observers. And you see that um, increasing each quarter. Um, and then we also have a, a pilot project where we're still fine tuning what works best on those vessels, where should the cameras be placed, uh, et cetera. But the goal is to be able to tell Congress at the end of all this, this is the number of programs we've implemented with your money. These are the number of vessels that we're now using and these are the improvements to stock assessments as a result of this uh, additional data. 
Uh, the NIMS Cooperative Research Program has two components, a national component, managed at headquarters, and a regional component. Just a quick uh, summary of the NIMS Cooperative Research Programs initiated um, uh, by the NIMS side of, of that um, fence, so to speak. Um, and then we also have Industry NIMS Cooperative Research. The Groundfish Forum has funded more than a dozen projects just over the last six years for its Amendment 80 trawl vessels with their cost of participation at about 100K a year. There's a range of uh, different research projects that they have been conducting in cooperation with NIMS scientists, mostly to reduce bycatch. The lower they get their bycatch, the more of their target species is available for them to harvest. Similar for the Pollock fishery, there is an industry university cooperative uh, program by the Pollock Conservation Cooperative at the University of Alaska. Uh, this group has funded more than $9 million in research and supported 51 graduate fellowships uh, since, 20, since 2000. Won't go into a lot of detail, but they provided the information on how they've distributed their funding uh, to research projects in both by uh, taxonomic groupings and by thematic groupings, but principally, you know, they're looking for improvements to catch their pollock quota, uh, to reduce salmon, groundfish, uh, non-target species, marine mammal interactions, um, et cetera. So lastly, um, the council has been working diligently to improve uh, it's outreach and communication with members of the public, members of the industry, members of the NGOs to get them involved as much as possible or to their uh, maximum interest in the council process. And here are you know, some suggestions on how to do that. Um, there's a person in each of the council AP and SSC rooms with this public testimony sheet to um, help people understand how to go about signing up for public testimony. Um, the amount of time they'll have, et cetera. Um, there's information on the website uh, and the staff is there to assist with distributing written testimony. They're submitted prior to the meeting and uploaded or distributed at the meeting and made copies and handed out. Numerous um, little fact sheets that the council has uh, generated, uh, these are online as well as uh, at the meetings uh, to again, help the council uh, to help the public understand the council process and how to get involved, uh, who are the council members, why do they have these authorities, and if you have an idea of, of, of changes to the status quo in terms of the fishery management plan or federal regulations, uh, how to go about that. So in summary, stakeholder participation has led to successful groundfish management through that public input at every stage of the council process, the stakeholder collaboration on research projects, continued outreach to tribes and rural communities and their virtual meetings now that we're under the pandemic. And then I would be surprised if they revert back to, completely revert back to uh, the old ways now that um, all the bugs have been worked out and likely additional public participation can be documented. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jane, for that impressive overview of Alaska fisheries management. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. Is there anyone in the audience <clears throat> who wants to unmute themselves and ask a question directly to Jane? So, Low Board Potter asks if we can get a copy of the presentation. Um, this recording will be posted to our webpage and um, will be viewable there. And I think we also have a copy of the slides. Yes. Um, I thought two chats come in while I was presenting, but I couldn't read them. So people were asking for either links to documents. I was wondering, you know, each fishery is such a unique combination of um, species, maturity, growth, uh, gear, uh, vessels, economics, um, how, how different or how similar are the different councils operating with all these different um, combinations? Uh, excellent question. And I, I you know, um, the range of species, the number of FMPs, 
um, the quality of the data going into the assessments, the types of cat catch accounting processes are all different around the country. I think um, my experience both on the East with the South Atlantic Council and then with the North Pacific Council, you know, first off in the North Pacific, you've got an order of magnitude difference in the scale of the fisheries. You have an order of magnitude difference, you know, qualitatively speaking in terms of the vessel numbers, the vessel sizes, the range of fisheries um, and the surveys. So I think Eastern Bering Sea Pollock is the best studied species in the country. Um, I, I may not be knowledgeable enough to convince you that it's in the world, but it's right up there. Um, relative to some of the snapper grouper species in the Gulf of Mexico, I mean, you know, there's just no comparison in terms of the, the data uh, quality. The frequency of the surveys, um, and and that was part of the next generation stock assessment approach. Was we are sending so much resources to the North Pacific because those fisheries are so valuable to the nation, um, but we can't continue to underserve the South Atlantic, the Gulf, the Mid Atlantic, uh, the, the Western Pacific, et cetera, the Caribbean which has, you know, really a paucity of information in terms of developing um, comparable stock assessments. So the idea of decreasing the frequency of stock assessments could free up some of the flat funding that we have that could go to other centers to enhance their stock assessments. And that's hopefully what you see in that bar chart when you see the dollars go up and then you also see the number of assessments go up and also the frequency of the assessments and the quality of the data going in. So, um, you know, the North Pacific um, and the Pacific Council, I think, are, you know, fairly comparable in, in terms of uh, resource dedication, surveys, et cetera. Um, but there certainly was concern by the council, the industry, the SSC, the plan team, that that change in the frequency of the, of the assessments was going to cost the North Pacific. And I think that, um, the agency has done its due diligence in, in assuring the council that uh, and the other stakeholders that that's not in fact the case that we are still maintaining the quality of those assessments. We're maintaining that ability to have that smaller buffer between attack and a ABC uh, to achieve that OY. Okay, um, we have hit uh, gone over our hour. I understand people probably have another meeting to go to or are already late. Um, still not seeing anyone who wants to ask a question directly, um, perhaps we should cut the recording off there. And I, I did have a couple other questions for you, Jane, if you're available to yeah. answer those. Okay. Um, so you talked a lot about electronic monitoring of uh, fishing effort, and I wondered if you thought that's we're going to see more and more of that in the next 10 years, or are we going to still have the human element in there putting people on boats? And That's a good question, and it's one we we, we hear often uh, around the country. Um, we'll always need observers. Um, the camera cannot collect ear bones um, and other you know stomachs, et cetera. We will always need observers, whether they all need to be on the boat at sea or whether they can be... Um, more safely collected shoreside might be, um, uh, you know, further discussion on that. Um, cameras, uh, you know, with the Congress sending three and a half million dollars um, for industry to develop advanced EM and EOR uh, applications, uh, as well as the agency getting about a comparable amount to stack that up on on the agency side. I think we, it's inevitable that there will be more and more EM programs. At some point, uh, all the fisheries that can accommodate cameras on board um, will do so. And there are a number of fisheries that are not observed, so we're not getting at sea data collection, either, you know, what fish are they or um, what are their sizes and stomach contents and ear bones, et cetera. Um, we're not getting any of that information that we will be able to get from cameras. Um, we can place cameras on small vessels. We're doing it in Alaska right now. Again, small vessels in Alaska, different um, than small vessels, say, in the Caribbean or the Gulf. 
but there have been um, uh, efforts um, out of Hawaii, out of the um, Pacific Island Center to place cameras on small vessels, very small vessels, it, artisanal vessels, so that better data collection can occur. So I think, you know, the trend is is for in, in, in continuing applications of EM and ER um, as everybody's got their cell phone on board the boat and you can, you know, use your app to send in both your recreational, your charter and your commercial fishing data um, uh, auto, auto, automatically. Once you're in cell phone coverage anyway, or satellite coverage. Okay, and to take advantage of your retired status, I was going to ask you to speculate about what you think congressional funding trends are going to be in the next several years. Oof. Um, I've been a little out of touch about the ongoing budget requests that the agency might be considering. I think it's it's fairly safe to say that. The industry has been, and, and NGO stakeholders have been very effective at communicating the needs for data modernization uh, to improve stock assessments around the country. We're grateful for their efforts. Um, we don't see these line items going away. Um, we have seen um, uh, enhancements to that. I mean, the Northeast gets additional observer dollars, observe funding, to place up to pay for placing observers on northeast vests, northeast and mid Atlantic vessels. Um, we don't, I, I'm not anticipating that that money's going away. Um, you know, the they've been, Congress has been uh, fairly generous with the stock assessment, um, uh, expanding stock assessment uh, program that has created a number of new staff positions around the country at the centers. Um, a lot of money, you know, going to support graduate fellowships uh, to enhance assessments. Um, I, again, I'm not familiar with any new initiatives that might be coming out, but we do have friends in Congress. Um, uh, so there are um, Alaska, you know, representatives, uh, uh, Senator Sullivan, Senator Murkowski, Representative Young, very, you know, it's in, um, it, Representative Young has one of the Magnuson Act author, uh, reauthorization bills um, that he's co-authored. So their their eyes are you know on what the councils are doing um, and what the agency is doing with the funds. So I you know I'm fairly optimistic that we're um, heading in the right direction in terms of improvements rather than um, losing losing funds. Okay, well that's good news. We're way over the hour. We still do have about 40 folks hanging out. Um, no one wants to unmute and, and take advantage of this opportunity to ask Gene a question before we go. You can email me directly if there's a link that you're interested in, um, or you could just Google next generation stock assessment and it'll take you to the technical report. Um, all of these slides I've taken from uh, websites or other presentations from um, NIMFs and the councils. So you, if you just did a Google on, on a certain topic area, you're likely to, to hit um, a lot of the places where I extracted some of these slides. Thanks everybody for, uh, for being here. Well, thank you for putting this together and sharing this with us, Jane. I've never seen such a comprehensive presentation on this topic. This is awesome. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you.